modern technology to uh, to facilitate um, to facilitate better wines. Really, um, tonight we've started off with actually one of our smallest growers, uh, the Jean Marc Ba Touraine Sauvignon Blanc. Um, the Ba family uh, farms in the southeastern corner of uh, the uh, of Touraine. Uh, it's 100% Sauvignon Blanc. They farm organically. Um, they are actually uh, they actually farm in a style called Terra Vitas. Uh, if you're not familiar with Terra Vitas farming, uh, Terra Vitas is a it's it's like halfway in between organic and biodynamic. It's not quite biodynamic. It's not, but it's it's a step above uh, organic farming. Um, the the, the value of being in the region of Touraine that they are in is uh, they're, they're th that southeastern region of Touraine has the best soil and, and the best climate conditions in Touraine to give some of the better Sauvignon Blanc that comes out of Loire Valley. Is it Sancerre? No, but it also doesn't have the Sancerre price tag to it. So it's something that's going to have that really crisp minerality to it, also beautiful fruit and beautiful herbaceousness but very soft on the palate and very quaffable at the same time. Um, Chris, while we're talking about the wine too, do you wanna talk about the cheese that, that we're pairing with it? Yeah, so if you're following along your sheet, uh, first thing you gotta do is, I hope everyone cut these up ahead of time. So let me see if I can get this up on the camera without making a mess. The first thing we're gonna do is that pyramid goat cheese. That's a goat cheese. We're gonna start off with the goat cheese first and it should be runny like that. Just leaking all over the place. So as Peter was talking about the Loire Valley, Loire Valley on top of their Sauvignon Blancs, uh, they're known for their goat cheeses. Uh, absolutely phenomenal fresh chev out there. But prior to cutting this cheese, uh, if you saw the pyramid shape on it, that mimics a cheese in the Loire called Valanque, uh, where it's this moldy ripened uh, or actually it's an ash. They coat it with a vegetable ash on the outside. Um, and that bacteria starts to penetrate through the, the rind of the cheese into the inside uh, where when they're ultra fresh, it will be a little firm. I'm really happy with the, where this cheese is at right now. It's at optimum where it should be. It's right at peak where it's nice and runny. So that mold actually permeated right through and it starts breaking it down from the outside in where it gets this nice runny texture. So this is 100% goat cheese from a, a dairy out in Maryland called Firefly Dairies, Firefly Farms, and that's what they specialize in. They specialize in 100% uh, goat's milk cheese. Uh, classic pairing is Sauvignon Blanc and goat cheese because goat cheese is a little bit acidic. The difference with this goat cheese, again, they're trying to mimic Valenque out of France but instead of using the ash uh, mold on it, the ash uh, rind, they're using, so if you like blue cheese, this has a little, this resembles a little blue cheese. It does have the blue cheese mold, the uh, penicillin uh, Rocca Forti. They combine that with the penicillin uh, Candidum, which is your regular blooming, uh, like your white uh, billowy mold on breeze. So they combine the two and you get that effect on it. So when these are young, it's more powdery, billowy white, as this starts to age, it gets that dark moldy color on it. And that's where you want it. And it takes, it takes a great cheese monger that knows how to uh, finish these cheeses, how to age these cheeses, really uh, dictate the correct rightness of these cheeses to serve them to you, or at least to tell you, hey, you're gonna buy this cheese this week, wait till next week. It should be at optimum uh, eating at that point. So uh, first things first, take your wine before you start eating anything. Take your wine. Let's go right through the tasting grid. So smell the wine. I mean, this is this is very unique. And Peter and I were having conversation about this prior to that. Uh, Peter, walk them through the tasting of the wine, what they should be tasting, what they should be smelling. So classic Taurine really should have a little bit of an herbaceousness to it, but also uh, some fruit as well. Uh, what I love about what Chris has done with the pairing here is that the ashiness and the acidity of the goat cheese, the goat cheese also has a little bit of creaminess as well, but the acidity in the Touraine and the Sauvignon Blanc breaks that down. So you get all the beautiful fruit and herbaceousness of, of Touraine Sauvignon Blanc, 
And what the cheese is actually doing is highlighting almost a bit of an anise character uh, to this Sauvignon Blanc. And it also gives the Sauvignon Blanc a little bit more weight and texture. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc has a, has a, a nasty reputation almost of almost a nasty reputation of being in this light sort of nondescript wine, but real Sauvignon Blanc actually has a lot of character to it. Uh, it has a lot of complexity and depth to it. It's just hidden and it needs the right food to bring that out. So cheese is like the one that Chris selected really highlights all the deep flavors and complexity of this Taurine Sauvignon Blanc and allows it to develop more on your, on your palate. Yeah. So as you're tasting it, you feel the acidity. It's not super abrasive like a New Zealand style. Uh, that's what I like about this style of Sauvignon. That's why I always gravitate towards the Loire Valley. Um, so make your little notes if you want to on your sheets. Uh, the cheese, I don't know how about everybody else. I need a spoon for it. It's that runny. Use a cracker, uh, anything, just to scoop that. And there are cheeses like this. There's other cheeses like that where, I mean, they'll cut the top layer off literally with a really sharp pointed knife, trim the top layer off and you get a spoon in there and that's how you eat the cheese. Uh, it looks kind of bizarre. I always tell the story of this cheese. I served somebody one time and it was just riddled with mold. I sold it to her. It was riddled with mold uh, and I, it really smelly. And the woman got kind of freaked out by it and she came back, she returned the cheese. I said, there's nothing wrong with this. She goes, no, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever smelled or saw. I said, well, that's, that's what this is. And I trimmed the top off. I literally just drove a spoon into it and started eating it. And she's like, how can you eat that? I said, that's perfect. That's right where it should be. So anyway, dig into the cheese, take a, take a taste of the cheese on its own. Feel the texture. Well, really you're, you're getting the best of both worlds. Understand that this is this is American produced cheese, but it's in a, it's in a French style. And now you're taking French style Sauvignon Blanc straight from the Loire Valley. And and really, what's happening is is you're getting you're getting a full Loire Valley experience out of yeah. both the Sauvignon Blanc and the cheese in itself. Like if you were if you were to get on a plane and and go and visit any of the chateau in Loire Valley, this is pretty much exactly the experience you'd be having. Yeah, you get that little grittiness in it. Goat's milk isn't super fatty. Um, the proteins are a little different than cow and sheep's milk. Uh, but the one thing goat's milk is good for if you have uh, any lactose problems, uh, like with certain, like full, full blown cow's milk bothers me, unless it's really aged. Uh, goat's milk is very easily digest, digestible for myself. Uh, and again, if you have high cholesterol, anything, switch, try to switch over to goat's milk products, cheese, butter, anything you can. It's just more beneficial for you. But there is some grittiness to it. Some people get can't get past that. And there's also that inherent, and I there's nowhere else. To, it's barnyardy. It's for all intents and purposes. It's goaty. It's really gamey. So again, try the cheese on its own. Let it coat your entire palate. Then take a sip of the wine and watch the two melt together, hopefully, right? The um, the important thing about this area of terrain too is is the uh, the texture that the Sauvignon Blanc gets. It's it's way different from what you'll see in Napa Valley or in Sonoma or in uh, New Zealand. Uh, even the Sauvignon Blanc they grow in Alto Adige in, in Italy. This just develops more texture and more weight, which is which is why the cheese really helps here too. That creaminess and the acidity in the cheese really helps develop the layers of the wine. And that really is what terroir is all about in wine, is, is figuring out what foods match which wines and, and how to combine the two together. Uh, somebody's asking, can you eat the rind? You could. I mean, there's some people that eat the rind on every cheese. Uh, I, know, I know Peter knows him. There's a gentleman named uh, Ken. He owns Dairy Ann Cheese Shop. And it's one of the most well-known cheese shops in the Connecticut, if not New England. And uh, the first time I met Ken, you know, I was in the cheese business myself and we're sitting down, he's letting me taste cheeses that, you know, he really likes. And uh, he's watching me nibble around the rind. He's like, what the hell's wrong with you? Said, uh, what do you mean? He goes, eat the rind. 
said, I'm not eating that thing. He goes, eat the rind. I mean, like, really, eat the rind. So you can, and you know what? It, it's to understand what it's all about. Uh, it's totally up to you. Some rinds will interact differently with the wine. So you got to watch that because this has that blue cheese mold on the rind. It's going to really whack out the, the, uh, the wine pairing, the acidity in it. Uh, people always ask, how do you know when a pairing's bad? I mean, that wine will scream at you if it's the wrong pairing. That's why I try to steer away from blue cheeses, uh, just because tannins and blue cheese are just a bad, bad combination. So in the chat room, just chime in if you like this. Peter, what did you think of this one? Uh, I loved the pairing. I thought I thought it was spot on. Uh, I you're right with the with the rind on on this cheese the the rind on this cheese paired with the wine gives it a little bit of a of a, of a different flavor to it and throws things off uh but it if i had a riesling with the with the rind of this cheese i think it would be perfect uh but really it's it's the inside of this cheese and the pairing with the Samuel blanc that that matches in 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 the way it's supposed to go uh because at the same time if you had a if you had a Riesling with this cheese in, in the inside of this cheese, it wouldn't work. It would only work with the outside of the cheese. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's a difficult pairing to, to achieve, but it works really well in this instance. Right. Oh, good. Excellent. So thumbs up. People like it. They like it. What do you think? Good. Thumbs. Hey, good. Sometimes we get these things right. <laughs> Every once in a while, man. What's that? Every once in a while we get them right, you know? Every once in a while. It's, you know, we got a 50-50 shot, but you know what? People always ask, well, how do you, how do you really do this? It's, it's, well, you got to drink a lot of wine to understand what each, each region, what, you, what the varietals taste like from each region, and then just taste a lot of cheese. Uh, I mean, when I was a cheesemonger, I put on 60 pounds within two years just eating cheese all the time. So you get a feel for same thing, what each region, what each style, you know, can be produced from those regions. And then there's different interpretations everywhere. And that can be said about wine as well. Good. Excellent. So finish up your Sal Blanc. We'll get into the rosé. So we're going to get into the Varrock rosé. Uh, before that, there's a couple things. I mean, you keep in mind when you're doing the pairings. Uh, white wines, rosé, anything with low tannins. Tannins, low tannins, uh, bubbles. Sparkling wines work great with any kind of pairing just because the the bubbles, the effervescence in the sparkling wine cuts through the fat of any kind of food, but especially with cheeses. Uh, it just makes that flavor pop in your mouth. Uh, beer, beer is great. Again, low alcohol, no tannins, bubbles, that really works well. Uh, but when you get into aged cheeses, and there are some exceptions with this, when you get into some heavy aged cheese, your Parmigiano, your aged, super aged Goudas, uh, you can you definitely go with reds. You're going to need something beefy to handle those. Uh, but again, sometimes the tannins just whack out that cheese so bad, it'll just go right over the top on it. Um, if you've never tried, and again, the classic pairing is Chianti or any kind of red wine with a Parmigiano, try a white wine with it. If you have a heavily aged Parmesan with the nice white crystals in it, if you take a, the, the right white wine and pair it with that, it makes that cheese turn sweet. Those little crystals in that cheese will actually turn sweet on you. It's, it's, a, it's a trip to try, but I encourage people to do that. Try white wines with the hard aged cheeses. Uh, the funky cheeses, anything with like a wash rind that really smells, uh, we call them wash rinds or even blue cheeses. Uh, something like that, again, Peter was talking about, especially with this, with the goat cheese we just had, if you did a Riesling with it, when you're nibbling on the outside, it would definitely complement that flavor. Uh, so with anything like a wash rind, an orange rind, you want some, you want a Riesling, you want like an Alsatian Riesling. You don't want something super sweet, but something with good fruit quality. Uh, with blue cheeses, you want to go sauternes, you want to go port wines, uh, something with that, you know, thick, heavy concentration of fruit on it. Again, sparkling wines are great with anything like a triple creme, a brie, anything really fat, full, rich cheeses. Uh, and then just what we did here with that first cheese, uh, the whole thing of what grows together goes together. So what we try to mimic here with the Loire Valley, it works because that's, that's just what happens out there. They grow a lot of goat cheese. But even if you go to like Emilia Romana in Italy, 
Um, what do they do a lot out there? I mean, Lambrusco grows like crazy out there. Try Lambrusco with uh, Parmesan Reggiano, Parma Brugiuto, anything like that. It just goes hand in hand. Um, if all else fails, the final thing, if you really don't know what to do, I always tell people, use a sparkling wine or find like a good all-purpose cheese, like a cheddar. Like I always use Manchego. Manchego from Spain is my go-to cheese for anything. And that pretty much will pair with reds, whites, anything. Uh, especially the more aged ones. Um, yeah, do something like that. If you have any questions, you always reach out to anybody, any one of us. We're always happy to help you. So we're going into the rosé now. Yeah, we're going into the Brac Rosé. Uh, the Brac Rosé. Brac Rosé. Uh, so the story behind Brac is, is Brac is what um, really started the Village Wine portfolios, portfolio almost 25 years ago. And the uh, Vrac is is a French wine buying term, uh, and it's and it's used by locals. So, l let's say you happen to live in in Touraine, where we just had the Savion Blanc from, and you go to your local uh, you go to your local winery in Touraine, and you bring your growler and you go right up to the barrel, or you go right up to the stainless steel tank, and you fill up your growler with Savion Blanc and and bring it home, and that's your wine for the week. And that's a wine buying term in France called buying wine en vrac. And, it, and the whole idea is that it's the village wine, it's the everyday wine, it's what everybody around that region drinks on, on a regular basis. And the idea behind this was, okay, let's bring that experience to the United States at a, um, in, in a cost-effective way for, for wine drinkers that where you can experience um, uh, regionally correct, varietally correct wines uh, that are coming directly from the producers and not have to pay um, upcharges for marketing and all the other stuff that's out there uh, that, that builds brands, if you will. Uh, so VRAC is, is, is really where it all started. Um, this particular wine, the Rosé, has, has been in, in most likely will always be made by Chateau Rouet in Provence. Uh, Chateau Rouet's property is about a 10 minute drive from the Mediterranean uh, in the heart of Provence. It's a blend of Tiborin, uh, Cinso, and Grenache, uh, mostly Tiborin, uh, but this is what's called uh, VDM or Vinda Mediterranean uh, because it's using fruit grown all throughout the Mediterranean region of um, of France. So it's not just specifically Provence, but it's even the outlying regions of Provence. Uh, one of the things that sets the VRAC apart as well is, is, is while it's not certified, ev everything that VRAC makes is farmed organically. Uh, and, and that's an effort that we make to be able to work with, um, in this particular instance, with Rue to make sure that they're making all the right choices in their farms, in, the, in their vineyards, to make sure they're making all the best fruit as well. Uh, the 2019 Brac Rosé, I'm actually super excited about. I think it's a, a little bit more along the lines of traditional uh, Provence Rosé. I thought uh, the 2018 was maybe a little bit too acidic and slightly uh, over the top on the herbal and floral side. Uh, the 2019 has a little bit more fruit to it, is more accessible uh, and a little fresher on the palate. Um, I I like to call it giggle juice because after one or two glasses of this, it's going to make you start to giggle because it's, it's just really super delicious and, and super easy to drink and refreshing. And we're starting to get to rosé season here. Um, you know, we had two beautiful days this weekend. We had a couple of days that surpassed 70 degrees. Everybody's feeling a little bit more alive out there. And this is the time when rosé really starts to sparkle, if you will, and take off. And this is one of the wines I can really see people gravitating towards because of how refreshing it is, how easy it is to drink. It could be, you can put it in your glass super cold. It can warm up in your glass and it's still beautiful to drink. It's just something that's really versatile. Uh, and I'll let Chris speak to the food pairing or to the cheese pairing because I think it, I think this cheese pairing works exceptionally well. Uh, just a quick note. Um, some people didn't get the uh, Firefly. They got the Cypress Grove. Cypress Grove is from Humboldt County, California. Uh, Mary Keene is the cheesemaker, head cheesemaker there. She's one of the premier goat cheese producers in the United States. 
they do make this aged goat cheese called Midnight Moon, if you could ever find that. They, I mean, they're famous for the uh, Humble Fog. So it's the semi-aged goat cheese with the ash in it and that everybody else mimics uh, to this day. There's other goat cheese producers that will mimic that. But I gave a, a few people in the audience tonight some of their fresh chev. And the Sauvignon Blanc works just the same like that with their, their little uh, chev discs. Even some people even got the uh, chev mixed with some fresh herbs. And I think the herbal notes in the wine really uh, complement the herbal notes in the cheese. But for your second cheese tonight, uh, we're going to go to California, Thurman, Cal uh, excuse me, Thurman, New York, uh, Nettle Meadow Farms. And Nettle Meadow does a lot of different styles of cheeses. They do have herds of ca uh, cows, goats, and sheep. So this is simply sheep. This is 100% sheep's milk cheese. What else? Uh, the other thing Nettle Meadow does, their, their farm is home to 100 plus different rescue farm animals. It's called a sanctuary. They actually have a sanctuary there. So over the hundreds of acres of farmland they have out there, they take in all these older or just, you know, uh, farm animals that nobody else wants and they take them in and they rehab them and they're just free to live their life out there, which is pretty cool. Uh, check them out online. Uh, everything they do is sustainable and they try to do as much organic as they can. Uh, so with the Simply Sheep, when you took that out, Again, semi-aged sheep's milk cheese, very soft paste in the interior, does have that semi-bloomy rind on the outside. So when you smell the cheese, get that little bit of vegetable quality on it. Sheep's milk cheese is fattier than goat's milk. Um, it has a little more salinity to it. It's a little, it's, it's, it's very creamier. It's more creamier than goat cheese, definitely. But it has this rich, nutty, kind of flavor profile. And especially as it's aged, uh, in like in Manchego, you get that full nutty, nutty flavor to it. So take a bite of the cheese, coat your entire palate with the cheese, just literally smush it all around the roof of your mouth. You get that, I mean, that, that bloomy rind, you get that little bit of broccoli, that little bit of like cauliflower flavor from it. Mm. Excellent. Now, again, take another bite, coat your whole palate, and take a sip of the wine with it. And the vr the vrac has just just ever so slightly a little bit of texture to it. There's there's not a lot. There's there's just this little mid palate appeal to it. So when you combine it with the cheese, everything just sort of. Um, rounds out your palate and, and, and coats your palate in just the right way. And then it finishes with very fresh acidity that cleans everything up and yeah. allows your palate to get ready for another piece of cheese and, a, and yeah. another sip of wine. It's, um, that's a good point. I mean, that's a great point he brought up. It cleans your palate. Again, when that, I'm surprised how creamy this sheep's milk is. And it just layers right onto your palate. Not super thick like a triple creme, but keeps this nice even coat. As soon as you take a sip of that wine, it cleans it right out. That's that's I love that about that. It's really good. The um the the VRAC will be available in uh a lot of different formats this year too. Uh just to let you all know what 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 your options are gonna be. We have the traditional 750 uh milliliter bottles. Uh it will be available in Magnums. Uh it also comes in three liter bag and box. And it co also comes in three liter pouches as well. Uh, the pouches essentially eliminate uh, the cardboard box around the around the around the bladder inside the box and make it makes it more pat, um, portable. Uh, and then this year, for the first time, we will also have 250 milliliter mini pouches. So it's essentially um, two glasses of wine inside a mini pouch uh, of delicious rosé. Uh, those will come packed in 12 packs and can be thrown right in your cooler to take to the beach or the park or your boat or wherever you're going outside. Should we so, ever get outside again? Yeah. So literally like an adult Capri Sun without yes. the straw. Are you getting the straws for that? Uh, we're working on the straws right now. Yeah. That's gonna, it's gonna be a trip seeing those. <laughs> so what did everybody think of that, Perry? Thumbs up? What do you think? 
how many people just enjoy the cheese. I mean, it's okay to like one or the other. You know, we hope that everything works well with everybody. But again, it, everybody has their particular taste and everything. Thumbs up. Good. Thank you. Excellent. So finish up. Finish up that round. Take your notes. Yeah, that rosé is nice and crisp. I enjoy that. It's really great once um, once this warm weather really kicks in and you keep this on ice in a cooler, that cold rosé, it just gets crisper and leaner and easier to drink. It becomes really refreshing. Yeah, big time. Yeah, when you're outside in the heat, this is, we were talking about crushable wines earlier. When you're out there, it's hot. You start pouring this, and Carol did it this, I think, this past weekend. She's like, yeah, that bag disappeared fast. I mean, when you're a group of people, it's hot out. You're having, you know, outdoor dinner, eating. It's going to go down super fast. But that's its intention, right? Yep. That's the idea behind rosé. Refreshing and easy. Now, is Varrock available all year round yet? Yes. Um, we have had... No issues with supply. Uh, 2018 sold out in January of this year, and the 2019 was right behind it. It was literally 2018 sold out the third week of January. 2019 was in first week of February, so it rolled right. very quickly. Right, and that's that's another thing. And we're we're almost to that point now, uh, where people are accepting rosé all year long. And that's the intention is the more we keep drinking rosé and uh, people understand it's not just a summer and spring thing. It's you can do this all year round. Year round. Yeah. Year round. And we're almost seeing that with our suppliers, with our distributors, we're almost seeing that. And people are more accepting of the previous year rosé too. And they're honestly, a lot of the 2018s are drinking really good right now uh, compared to some of their 2019 counterparts. So again, but again, use a little caution with that really ask around no matter where you are ask before that uh, that's not the rule for all previous year rosé so really throw some caution up but don't be don't be scared of a 2018 rosé right now yeah that's that's a really important point that that chris makes too is that there's uh there's are some people that are afraid to take a chance on a, on a 2018 rosé thinking it, it might be a little bit past its prime, but there are a lot of rosés that are made uh, these days that actually get better with, with a year or two on them. It depends on the rosé, and that's why it's important for you as consumers to have a retailer like Chris who knows his wines and can point you in the direction of things that are the right wines for you to drink. So Chris will know what 2018 rosés are the right ones to put in your glass versus which ones are the wrong ones. So it's important to ask those questions. So like we took a shot at a couple 2018 Sancerre's and they've been great. And again, when I send those emails out, I don't want to sound like the crazy 80 ads from, uh, from the eighties, <laughs> but uh, what do you call it? Sancerre is a great region. Uh, some of these smaller producers are, you know, they're they're not built to age, but like we're talking about, the previous year is still very drinkable. It takes on different characteristics, uh, especially with the one I featured this week. Um, so it's a little softer. The acidity isn't super bright on it, but it's still very drinkable. And to find a, a Rosé Sancerre under $15, it's, it's incredible. So again, no matter where you are, whatever restaurant you are, or if you're at another retailer, you know, just ask those questions. Ask the questions and find out if it's going to fit your palate. You know, you're buying the wine. I tell people this all the time. You buy the wine. You're buying the wine. You have every right to talk about this, you know, ask those questions to really narrow down the field to if this is going to be the right wine for you. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Even at a restaurant, ask those questions. We had a situation last year, not us personally, one of our customers, uh, she drinks Whispering Angel. We can't talk her out of that, but she likes it. So you know what? That's that's on her. You know, she likes it and you can't steer people away from that. But uh, she went to a restaurant and they had it on 
the uh, by the glass pour for like under ten dollars a glass. She's like, wow, that's incredible. You know, get me a glass. And they poured it for her. And she's like, this is not Whispering Angel. And she asked, can I see the bottle? And they wouldn't produce a bottle for her to show her. So, you know, if, if you have somebody that drinks something consistently, they know that flavor profile. Um, and it, it's kind of disheartening that a restaurant would do that. But that's what happens out there sometimes, you know. We all can't, they all can't be honest, but excellent. So what's, we're getting into pairing number three. So the uh, final wine of the night is the uh, Robert Giborg uh, Bourgogne uh, Clouseau de Clos Prior. Uh, this is 2014 vintage. And 2014 vintage in Burgundy, um, you know, it, it every, all the retailers wanted 2015 because 2015 got all the reviews and got all the press and it was what everybody talked about. Everybody said 2015, this is gonna be a great vintage. 2014 was sort of the, um, was, was sort of skipped over. Not, not many people really paid attention to it. Uh, but what we come to find out through studying the vintages is that 2014 ends up being a vintage that, that could be better than 2015. Um, and as we see in this wine here, the 2014 is more approachable than many of the 2015s that are in the market right now and sitting in people's cellars. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the things I love about this particular uh, red burgundy is you don't often get a chance to, to see a red burgundy in its prime, especially at this price level. It's right. very... I, uh, Chris, I don't know. I don't know what you charge for this in the store. I have to imagine it's somewhere around. Well, I don't know. Is, is it around twenty bucks? No, it's on sale this week. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, you know, at this at this price level, it's hard to find really good red burgundy that's going to show this type of age and show this type of maturity to it. Um, what you're finding from this wine is that it, it's showing classic uh, color characteristics. So you're starting to see the color turn uh, more to a brickish color, but still maintain a lot of its ruby character to it. Uh, the aromas are, are really deep, showing a lot of cherry aromas, but the cherries are a little bit more dried. Uh, you're starting to see some earthy tones come out of the wine and a lot of herbal characteristics as well. But then this long finish to this wine that's very deceptive because the finish actually has acidity to it. And while it has acidity, it also has gripping tannins. So the tannins hold on to your palate and keep, and keep the flavors going on your palate, but the acidity rounds everything out and keeps the wine balanced and keeps it round. Uh, it's, one of, it, it's one of my favorite wines in our portfolio right now because of its value. Uh, it's 100% Pinot Noir. Uh, the Gibor family has been farming in uh, in Burgundy since 1976. Um, so they're not the oldest family in Burgundy, but they've been producing very consistent wines through their time there. They do farm organically and sustainably. Um, and uh, the wines are actually made by Robert's son-in-law, uh, Sebastian Bideau, uh, and they hold some of the some of the most uh, classic holdings of Pinot Noir within Burgundy. So, in order to make this Burgundy, uh, he pulls grapes from some of his more famous vineyards, uh, Ladois, Chory Les Bon, uh, Maurice Saint Denis, and the um, the grapes that don't go into those single vineyard holdings actually go into this bottling. So you're getting essentially the cream of the crop without. Uh, without the expense, if you will. Right. No, that's, that's how, when Peter, uh, you know, brings this in for us, you know, I want to touch on what he said and, you know, Jeff's in the room too. And everybody remembers Jeff. Uh, when we talk about the rating system, uh, every, take that with a grain of salt. We try not to be so fixated. At least I came from a place where they were so fixated on points and ratings that it drove me insane because you overlook all these great wines because they don't want to be bothered with it. They don't want to be bothered to subscribe to the rating system. It gets to be kind of a joke every once in a while. Uh, but Peter touched, touched a little bit on uh, vintage charts and great vintages. And uh, I can remember just 
when I first got into the industry, um, working under somebody that I really respected, you know, the 2001 uh, vintage of Brunello and Peter was in the retail end too. And the ratings that came out for the 2001 vintage were off the charts. So if you were a Brunello producer selling 2001 Brunello, you were, if your Brunello was under 90 points, you were doing something wrong. Uh, and then 2003 again came back and it was like, again, all, you know, upper nineties for the ratings, but everybody didn't look at 2002 because of all these charts and all these ratings and say, well, 2002 wasn't that good, but you find tremendous values in these off years that you should pay attention to because again, you're saving money. Yeah. Wine makers aren't going to make horrible wine in any vintage. Uh, they're still going to make wine. I had somebody comment, and this is years ago, I, I used to bring in wines from Long Island and there was a couple of vineyards out there that collaborate on this Merlot and they issue it every year. And somebody made a comment, that was a bad year. I said, well, they still sold the wine, didn't they? He goes, well, yeah, it was a bad year though, but they're still making the wine and it's subjective to everybody's palate. So if you follow vintage charts, you know, look at in between all those really great, highly rated vintages, you're going to find tremendous value in those where everybody's clamoring for all those high ratings and everything. You know, people are overlooking some of the real gems in that portfolio of all these winemakers, I think. And Chris, to your point, uh, you know, the more difficult, the more difficult the vintage, the, the better the talent of the winemaker. That's when you find out how good your winemaker is and what he can achieve uh, in his cellar. Because if he's working with inferior product and tur still turns out a really great bottle of wine, then you know how talented that winemaker in the cellar is. In the end, wine is really made in the vineyard. That, that's where wine is made. With, with your vineyard care and your viticulture and your practices, your pruning, uh, your, uh, your cover crop, and all the things that you're doing to take care of your soil and your vines. But you still have to make sure that the processes that you are, um, that you are undertaking in the cellar are the right ones in order to make great wine. So if you want to find out the true talent of a winemaker, take, take a vintage that uh, all the wine media say is a challenge mm -hmm. and go find who's making the best wine in that vintage. And that is who is truly your talented winemaker. No, it really is. That's a great point. Excellent. How's everybody like that Pinot Noir, that red burgundy? Good. Yeah, I mean, for the price point it's at, uh, I thought it was exceptional. Uh, especially when Peter words his emails. If you're not taking advantage of this, he goes, I don't know what you're thinking right now. And it's like, same thing. I'm like, well, I gotta, you know, I gotta take advantage of it. Again, you find in this industry, you find uh, salespeople that are really passionate and you really take their heart, you know, their word for it. Uh, when Jeff was our sales guy for Eater, you know, with Peter at Village, you know, when they're sending us stuff, uh, once you get to understand what they like and everything, where, where their passion is, and when they send you emails like that, you got to jump on it. Because if you agree with that person's palate, you take a shot at it. And, you know, as soon as that Pinot Noir came in, I took a bottle home. And if you follow me on Instagram or anything, uh, you can see where I am on a Sunday night and I just get deep into the bottle. I'm like, wow, this is just, just really good Pinot. Uh, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. Good. It, uh, it really expresses all the, all the nuances that Burgundy has to offer. And for, um, I, Bur Burgundy is, is, uh, is a love of mine and, and, and a passion and, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of, a little bit of a problem because, uh, it, it tends to it tends to drain my wallet more than I should allow it to, uh, but it when you, when when you get into really good burgundy, it it drives your palate because you're trying to find that really great value in, in the one thing that's going to show all the nuances and all the beauty of what burgundy can offer without having to spend four hundred dollars a bottle. Yeah, does this drink like a four hundred dollar bottle of burgundy? No, it doesn't. But if I'm roasting a chicken on a, on a Sunday night or on a Tuesday night or what's today? When, does anybody know what day it is? It's Wednesday, right? Wednesday? 
no one's keeping track. I mean, we're right. we're etching stuff on the wall like we're in prison or something, <laughs> like on Castaway. It's, we're it's etching on Wednesday. Wednesday. So if you're roasting yeah. a chicken on a Wednesday night and you want a really great bottle of Burgundy, this does the trick, and you can be totally happy with this, and you're going to get a really great Burgundy experience. So again, does it drink like a four hundred dollar bottle? No, but are you totally satisfied with it? Absolutely. Yeah, I enjoy it because the tannins aren't super grippy on it. And the, the acidity is there. Uh, so for the cheese pairing, so now we're going to go up to Vermont, uh, to Jasper Hill Cellars uh, up in Greensboro, Vermont. What Jasper Hill is really known for, if you didn't know, uh, they have 22,000, 22,000. Uh, square feet of underground cellars and caves. That's their claim to fame up there. They do make phenomenal cheeses, phenomenal cheeses. But their biggest contribution to the cheese industry are their caves. And everybody, there, there's cheese makers all over the New England area and further out that come to Jasper Hills just to age their cheeses because their caves are perfected with certain bacteria, natural bacteria that permeate the cheese and just age it perfectly. If you've ever been to a Murray's Cheese in New York City, um, if you haven't, definitely go there. It's an experience. All their caves were designed by the same people. So where you could take a young cheese from any dairy, and this is what happens, and Murray's does it too. They'll take these young cheeses, buy them at a substantial savings, and age them in their caves. Again, with that though, you know, price goes up. Once you start aging anything, whether it's wine, cheese, anything, you know, price starts going up. I mean, it's you're you're tying up real estate space in the cellar, and you got to get a return on that. But uh, that's what Jasper Hill is known for. Um, so what you're tasting now, so this is a, actually a collaboration. Um, so the cream, the milk rather, comes from Cabot, and everybody knows Cabot. Uh, when you look at any grocery store, you see just the big blocks of Cabot cheese in there. But there's with any of these bigger companies that mass produce like that, they still go back to focusing on small production. So again, when we talk, you know, like Jeff's here, when we talked about Behringer, Behringer didn't make white Zinfandel. They couldn't do all the other fun projects that they do. And that could, that could be said about a lot of winemakers. They have to make something that keeps turning the income so they can pay for all the real estate that some of the more aged wine and more expensive wines take up time and room for. So with Jasper Hills, uh, they partnered up with Cabot Creamery on this. This is 100% cow's milk cheese. So this is aged in their cellar for 12 months. And if you cut in, when, when you first took this out of the wrapper and you cut into it, you see that natural rind on it. Uh, that's just from that cave aging. And especially when you first take that out of the cheese, uh, out of the packaging, you smell that kind of mustiness on it, right? Now, smell the cheese now. Yeah, see Ken at Dairy Ed. Yeah, absolutely. So smell the cheese. It's that classic cheddar smell on it. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Take a bite on it. When you're biting into it, you taste those crystals in it. All that calcium deposit, we call it the cheese crunchies. I gotta say, dude, I never thought about pairing burgundy with cheddar, but that works really well. Good. Just because of the earthiness from the cave aging and a little bit of that earthiness on the wine, I wanted to see how that would match, especially because that's soft and tannin. Uh, I didn't want to blow this cheese out. Now, I'll take a sip of the wine with it. Ken's a trip. If you're ever in Darien, again, once you get down to Fairfield County, you got Darien cheese. You go see Laura over Fair. at Fairfield Cheese Company. If you're in Greenwich, go see uh, Chris at Greenwich Cheese Company. Uh, all probably some of the best cheese people in the business in Connecticut. Uh, Ken was funny. So when I was in the cheese business, I used to, I used to be a cheese buyer and cheese monger at Liuzzi's, and uh, they would offer me certain cheeses, you know, at a discount uh, just because they wanted to move them. And you know, if you've never been to Liuzzi's, they do tremendous volume. Uh, 
So my first question would be, did you offer this to Ken yet? And this is before I ever met the guy, but I knew his legacy in Connecticut. I knew his reputation. But like, no, we didn't even talk to him about this yet. I'm like, how many do you have? And whatever poundage they have, I said, send me everything, send me everything. And when I left there, I went down to go meet him. And he, he couldn't have been a nicer guy to me. Just, just tremendous. It, you know, everybody there uh, to the point where I walked in day, a couple of days before Thanksgiving and he had a line out the door and I'm just waiting like everybody else. He sees me online and goes, stand over there right now. Get over there. I'm like, what? What, what happened? I said, what, are you going to put me to work? No, no, we're going to talk and try cheese. I'm like, well, you got a line out the door. He's like, no, we're going to try cheese. Don't worry about it. I mean, just a great stand-up guy. Even Laura, if you can get down to Fairfield, talk to Laura. And they have great wine palettes. I know Ken's very into beer. Uh, so really ask, you know, get down there and ask them all. Madison cheese too, yeah. Cheese options in New London County. Oh, go see Fred. Fred, uh, I think. Yeah, you go see Fred at Thames. Yep, oh, forgot God. about Fred. Yeah, I think, yeah, Fred's fantastic. He's a great wine palette up there. Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, somebody, somebody made a comment on a podcast that there's no good wine shops in Connecticut. I'm not even putting ourselves in the mix, but I'm like, and I've been hammering them with, you know, trying to get answers out of them, trying to find this, you know, uh, person's email or contact saying, oh, you can't make a comment like that, especially, you know, you can pick any county in Connecticut and there's great cheese shops, wine shops, so many reputable people out there that you really you should just never make a comment like that. They're out there. You just got to seek them out. But yeah, they're, they're there. I, Chris, I have to say that they're, um, the uh, landscape has changed over the last five or six years yeah, in Connecticut. Right. And I will say that there are less progressive stores like yours yeah. in the state than there were five or six years ago. Right. So, right. Um, there's a lot of formula stores in Connecticut at this point. Uh, yeah. Your store is not a formula, formula store. Your store is more of a progressive store. Uh, but yes, there are good, I will, as you were saying, yes, there are plenty of good wine stores in Connecticut. We've just lost a lot of them. Yeah. Right. True. Good. How does everybody like this pairing? Good. Thumbs up. This cheddar is absolutely incredible. Something like a cheddar, like in the email I sent everybody home, take the cheeses out like an hour before you serve them. Cheddar, this cheddar especially, you can leave it out for a few hours. You can leave it out all day. Uh, the more this thing sweats, the more flavor comes out of it. Uh, I always talk about the Dubliner, that Irish cheddar by Kerry Gold. You can find it everywhere. And everybody, a lot of people laugh uh, because it's so mass produced. But if you leave that cheddar out for, you know, say eight hours, the flavors that come out of that cheese are so intense. It, I, I've been fooled into thinking it was a young Parmesan, just intense caramelization on it, uh, a little nuttiness, a little sweetness out of it, just really great flavor, especially with these other cheeses. You take them out an hour before, you want them weeping, as you saw with the goat cheese. I mean, it's just running all over the place. That's where you want it. The sheep's milk, you know, you don't want it like a paste. You want it a little more malleable than this. And then something like a cheddar, if you could get this thing sweating, it's fantastic. The oils really start coming out of it. It's really great. Somebody's commenting, the best cheddar we ever had. Yeah, no, it's, when you taste around, there used to be this uh, couple out of, I forget where they were, um, out in Danbury. You see, their business was finding all these small artisan cheese producers. And again, I'm talking 12, 12 15 years ago. And artisan cheese now has changed drastically. Uh, the availability, the accessibility to a lot of these artisan producers is a lot more accessible. Back when I was in the business, it was tough. It was really, you know, it, it was like you had to be Indiana Jones going on an adventure and try to track down these people. And uh, I found this small company based in Connecticut that would literally call you up on a Monday saying, this is where we're going. We're driving through New England into Canada, New York, and back down. What do you want? This is what we're looking for. And you give them their whole thing. And I did this whole New England cheddar thing. Uh, and Jasper was on the list. And before they were who they are now, uh, 
Shelburne Farms was on there and some of the best cheddars I've ever had. Like sharp, where people talk about provolone, again, if you don't know the Uzi's, it's predominantly Italian cheeses. And I got some of the best provolone in the world there. Uh, but some of these cheddars from Vermont were so intense. They felt like a knife, the acidity and the sharpness of it, just cutting your palate in half. Uh, really something to try. But yeah, no, Jasper Hill, I mean, they're fantastic at cheddaring. Yeah. That's great. Who's cat is cool. Uh, <laughs> apparently my cat made a guest appearance. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, wants to be in the show. Good. He, uh, he got a, he got a sense of the cheese and decided to, uh, make an appearance on the couch. Oh yeah. Well, if my, my dogs have longer legs, they'd be jumping up here trying to eat this too. Uh, same thing. When I was cutting up the cheese and everything, my male dog's right under my feet waiting for me to drop anything I, that he could get his paws on. Uh, the females over here whimpering too. But what did you think of the pairing? Uh, I loved it. Again, I, um, pairing burgundy with cheddar is not something I would, I would, I would normally consider. And I thought it, I thought it worked really well. Uh, it brought me back to uh, one of the one of the first wine dinners I ever did uh, to 20 years ago with uh, Nicola Zangi uh, down in Stanford. And we were featuring um, the wines from Newton Vineyards in California. And he wanted to do a salmon dish with Newton's Merlot, their unfiltered Merlot. And I wanted to slap him. Like, what, what are you doing doing salmon with merlot are you trying to ruin the fresh start of my career like are you crazy and he said trust me trust me i got this i'll make it in a way where it'll make sense and lo and behold he, he did and he nailed it and it was one of the best um unusual pairings i've ever had in terms of in terms of food and wine and this this brought it back to me having burgundy with with this aged cheddar was fantastic some of those oddball pairings really stick out, and you remember those for years to come. Yeah. Again, when I was talking about, I had this heavy aged Parmesan, and uh, this is from uh, Bob Carboni. I don't know if you guys know him. He's been out in the field forever, uh, representing different companies here and there, different vineyards. He used to work for Hartley and Parker, but he walked into a store I was working at at the time with just these big chunks of like dark brown. I mean, it looked like brown sugar. Uh, just big chunks of brown sugar and uh, and a Pinot Grigio. He's like, try these. Try these together. And I was like, oh, my God, this is phenomenal. I would never have thought this pairing would work. He's like, no, that's that's the whole thing. It's It brings out the sweetness in the cheese. I'm like, there you go. Think outside the box. Somebody was asking before, what about the uh, quince paste or the guava paste? Try it with whatever. See what works with it, each thing. You know, you'll, you'll find these combinations. And, you know, they sound whacked out, but they work. And if it works for you, there you go. And that's all it needs to do. It has to work for you. And you can throw a lot of these rules, throw a lot of these rules out the window. And as long as it works for you, that's, that's all that really matters. Excellent. How'd everybody like the burgundy? Awesome. Good. Good. Thumbs up. Uh, good, somebody's good, got a good. question. What, what would the French uh, pair with burgundy. So if you were in France, what would they pair with red burgundy? What's the classic pairing out there? Coco Vin. Coco Vin, right. There you go. Got <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, how about with white burgundy? What's the classic pairing out there? I've never been. Um... That's a tough one. That is a tough one. Uh, I mean, you, you could do you could do roasted chicken. It's it's not coco vin, but it's roasted chicken. Any any roasted any roasted game. Um, white fish as well. Yeah. You know any white any white fish. Good. So individuals like Peter, like Jeff over there, they're they're a conduit. They're we live vicariously through them. They've had opportunities to get to these vineyards, to speak with these winemakers, really make that connection. They come back here and they, they talk to us about it. They really make us love these producers. Uh, I still tell the story. Peter brought this woman from California and 
and I just brought the wines in for myself to retry. But I, I still remember the story she told and the passion in her voice at, you know, as she's telling us the story of her making these wines and everything. And it, it's, it's something I would not have experienced uh, again, from a lot of these small producers that somebody like Peter goes and sees his company specializes in those people, uh, in those vineyards, finding those, those, those little particulars out. And, uh, you taste the wine, you really live through all that, through them, through you. And it's really something to behold. I'm trying to get his camera in focus. Good. Excellent. So, uh, before we conclude, if you have questions, start throwing them in the chat room. We'll start answering them as much as we can before we unmute everybody. Uh, they're saying monkfish with the uh, white burgundy. Not in France, but we've done monkfish. I've done monkfish with uh, Rioja, and it was phenomenal, where people sit there and say, oh, red wine with, with fish doesn't work. It just depends on what kind of fish you're making. If it's something big and meaty, which we can... Uh, you could touch on that a little bit, Peter, but we'll segue into something else Peter's company does with fish as we're talking about fish. Uh, Merceau goes with everything. Yeah, Merceau goes with everything. It's fantastic. Yeah, Merceau does go with everything. Um, actually, Chris, thank you for bringing that up. Um, well, uh, in, terms of, in terms of fish, um, if, you guys, if you guys are looking for, for fish at home, uh, our parent company is a company called Val's Ocean Pacific Seafood. Uh, they are the second largest seafood distributor in New York City. Uh, they have um, gone direct to consumer at this point. So if you want to get seafood delivered to your home, uh, I, I don't know all the details of it because I'm not on that end of the business. But if you are on Instagram, go follow Val's Ocean Pacific Seafood on Instagram and all the details of getting uh seafood delivered to your home or there. Uh, it's, it's very convenient. The, the seafood is all very good. Uh, we eat it on a regular basis here at home. Uh, it's, all, it, it's all really great stuff. They've, they've been supplying some of the best restaurants in New York City for the last 40 years. So um, if, if you have a need to get seafood delivered and it saves you a trip somewhere, it's a, it's a, it's a great resource. Yeah, and the specials they've been putting out on a daily basis on Instagram, if you follow them on Instagram, they're incredible. Um, and it comes right to your house. I mean, it can't be any more convenient, especially right now as we're going through all of this. Um, but take a look at it. And they have Mother's Day specials going on right now and a lot of different things each day. So, I mean, if you're into seafood, give them a shot. Uh, I talked to other people on social media and just coincidentally, they were promoting it. I'm like, oh my God, you know about this? They're like, yeah, this stuff's fantastic. And you see the things that they're cooking with. I'm like, well, yeah, I gotta get it. Especially with the, I mean, now we're rationing beef now. So it's like, okay, I see where this is going. So, mm -hmm. right, right. Uh, so before we conclude, uh, give Peter a round of applause, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight, taking a night off and uh, joining us. Thank you, yeah, everybody. Great. And Peter Appreciate used to be in the retail today. business two years ago and just went over to the other side. <laughs> yeah. The other side's better. Uh, Val's, Val's, what was it called again? Val's what? Val's Ocean Pacific. Uh, they're in the Bronx. Out of the Bronx. Here, I'll put it down for everybody so they can make note of it. Val's Ocean Pacific. But uh, before Peter leaves, if you have any questions, again, you know, ask them away. Um, and we made a comment in the description of this, you know, uh, real wine from real vineyards. Uh, yeah, it's, we're making a joke with that. But, uh, you know, there's real wine everywhere. But the more we can focus on some of these smaller producers to keep them around, it's, it's essential right now. Uh, the bigger guys are hurting, too. Everybody's hurting right now. Uh, so the more we can do to really promote that, especially with the cheese producers, I'm part of a, a group on social media, a bunch of other cheese mongers, really trying to raise awareness on this uh, and get people really to rethink their cheese buying. And I know it, it's, it's not the most affordable luxury out there right now, uh, especially talking to a few other cheese mongers around the country. You know, 
if you really got to put things in perspective, you know, you're talking about something 30, 35, $40 a pound. That's how much it's escalated. I mean, you really want to invest that into something like that. But when you're tasting something like this, even this little nibble of cheddar from Jasper Hill, there's so much flavor in a small amount. It's not like buying a big chunk of cheddar from the dairy case at Stop It Shop, um, you know, where you got to shred a lot, just tastes a lot. You're not getting any flavor. Uh, it's just more pure gratification than anything. There's, there's flavor in this. There's different nuances in this. So when you're tasting a wine like this, you can taste the different layers of flavor, the nuances and everything. That's what you're looking for. Uh, again, there's, there's, there's wine for every rhyme, reason, time and place. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. You know, and there's, who's saying my haircut looks amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, I have uh, my, I can't get a hairdresser out here. It's crazy, but thank you. Um, but hey, Peter, you know what? Thank you. We uh, truly appreciate it. I appreciate everything you do for our store and all these great wines that you bring in. Thanks for taking the time to do this. You um, bet. Uh, just one more, one more thing, if, yeah, if I can. Hey, Absolutely. Jess, to your point, uh, it, it, it's actually, it, it's actually a really important one because yes, these are, what we're finding is that we need more access. Everybody needs more access to these resources. And what we're finding uh, in, in this new way of operating is that these are the types of things that are going to continue because everybody needs more access. and We all can't get out all the time. We all have to be in our homes sometimes and we want this sort of access. You've got kids. I've got three of them. You know, it's hard to get out sometimes. It's hard to, it's hard to get where we need to be. Right. And through this pandemic, we're finding new ways to reach people and finding new ways to be a community. And especially through wine and cheese, it's one of the ways we can all come together and actually be a community while apart. Right. So to your point, yes, the retailers like Chris will be able to continue these things as the more people support them and the more people get involved. So thumbs up, your comments heard, and we will all continue to do this. Yeah, no, we're taking everything into consideration, even talking with all the sales uh, reps and they, this is a blast for us as well. Uh, just on this end, watching all of you in your homes and everything, you're so relaxed, you're having a good time. Uh, and that's what this is all about right now and as we carry on in the future with this. Uh, it's about everybody really understanding the wines but being comfortable with all of this where you're not being, you know, looked down upon by anybody, by somebody so pretentious. Uh, there's, there's a way to get into wine. Everybody, everybody always asks, how do we get into wine? Really just pop the cork and get into it. Really try it, understand it. Uh, a few people in the audience here bought books I recommended. Uh, start reading them. You know, it depends on what you want to do, but the easiest thing to do is pop a cork, get into it, understand it, and, you know, get into another region. This month in our Wine of the Month bag, we're featuring a Pinot Noir from the end of Valley. And people say, well, what's the difference? Well, you try different regions. That's the whole thing. You know, and the valley is vastly different than, you know, other regions of California. They have their own unique style. Considering the red burgundy you tried tonight, as you taste other red burgundies all over, you know, all over the region, they're all going to be so different. Uh, they're going to have their own unique style. Uh, Sauvignon Blancs, we've done classes on Sauvignon Blanc, and it's, if you just did Loire Valley Sauvignon Blancs from different, you know, AOC appellations in Loire, it, they're so different. They have some uh, inherent similar qualities, but they're very different. They have their own unique style. And I always relate everything back to pizza. So when you taste New Haven style pizza, you go to Sally's, Pepe's, Modern, Bar, you know, and some of the newer players on the scene, they're all unique. They're all different. And, you know, you get into these bickering battles with people. Oh, Zuparty's is better. Everybody has their own flavor profile. And it's, it's up to you to go out there, identify your individual palate, and really continue the exploration into different wines and really discover new things that you may like, you know? And, you know, we have people that take us on those journeys and really open up our eyes, you know, like Peter, like Jeff, you know, really take us in and, you know, you take us on this journey and you say, wow, this isn't like anything else I've tried. Uh, that Friolano, and Jeff was at that dinner too at uh, August, that Friolano you brought in, that stuff was fantastic. I've never had one like that. What was the name again? Corsic? Corsic. Of course, it was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And it takes somebody like that that's been there, that has that passion, and they translate that right through you. So, excellent. No, thank you all for coming tonight. So, it's been a trip. 
Cheers to you all.